Mm-hmm. at the top. Um, hopefully, um, you had a chance to see the Secretary's uh, condolence statement uh, about the passing of former Senator Bob Dole. I just want to reiterate um, the, the key points of that, obviously, that he was a, a true American hero, uh, bravely served in World War II uh, uh, in Italy, uh, suffered grievous wounds trying to help save the life of uh, uh, one of his troopers, and uh, and then of course went on to an incredible life of public service. And all of us here at the Department of Defense want to express our condolences, our, our thoughts and prayers to the to the Dole family. Um, hopefully, you also got a chance to see the Secretary's statement on the inherent risks to the Department of a potential long-term continuing resolution now. Uh, there is a continuing resolution that has been that was passed. Of course, you, you saw that over the weekend that um, ends in middle mid February. Um, but we have seen some suggestions. Uh, some people are talking about the potential for a longer term, maybe even as long as a full year. And the secretary wanted to lay out clearly uh, his concerns about that. I won't reiterate those. Hopefully, you've seen those statements. But essentially, it really does tie. The department's hands when it comes to flexibility uh, in, in terms of budgeting and, and starting new programs, building new ships, really advancing new capabilities. Uh, so uh, he continues to urge Congress uh, uh, to pass uh, an appropriations bill that funds us at uh, the president's request uh, for this fiscal year uh, so that we can continue to do the job we need to do to defend the nation. And again, if you haven't seen that, it's, um, it's on our site. Um, I do want to announce that the Secretary has now approved the next round of uh, departmental advisory boards uh, and committees for resumption of, uh, of duties and operations. Uh, the, the three that we can announce that we are going to resume and uh, are the Defense Advisory Committee on Military Personnel Testing, the Board of Advisors for the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, and the Reserve Forces Policy Board. Um, positions for these boards uh, will be filled now in the coming weeks, and we'll be uh, transparent with you as that happens. But uh, I did think it was important to let you know that uh, that we did uh, restore and, and announce the, the resumption of, of those three boards. We look forward to getting them filled and, and seeing them get to work uh, and provide useful advice and counsel for the department. Um, on a personnel note, we're pleased to announce the arrival of Mr. Kingston Reef as the new Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Threat Reduction and Arms Control, and that's part of the acquisition and sustainment team. Uh, Kingston joined the team right at the end of last month, November 29th, and uh, he comes to the department uh, from a job as the former director of uh, disarmament and threat reduction policy at the Arms Control Association. So we welcome aboard. Uh, glad to have him here and uh, look forward to his expertise going forward. Uh, and then finally, tomorrow, I think you all know, is the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Secretary of the Navy, Carlos del Toro, will be the keynote speaker at an event uh, out there in Hawaii uh, attended by approximately 40 Pearl Harbor survivors. Uh, the event will begin at 1.40 Eastern Time. Uh, it'll be live streamed, obviously, on our website. Then at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, the U.S. Navy, in partnership with the Department of Defense, POW, MIA Accounting Agency, and the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific will host the reinterment for the 33 remaining unknown sailors uh, who were lost uh, in the attack on Pearl Harbor aboard the USS Oklahoma. Through the six-year effort of Project Oklahoma, 355 of 388 sailors and Marines have been identified. So incredible work, uh, and we're grateful for everything that uh, the POW MIA office is doing out there in Hawaii. As you know, the Secretary had a chance to visit with them uh, not too long ago. It truly is incredible what, they, what they're doing uh, to provide some closure, not just for the United States Navy and Marine Corps, but also for so many families of World War II veterans. Okay, with that, we'll start uh, with you, Lita. Thanks, John. Um, can you update us on uh, Ukraine and the Secretary's uh, schedule? Has he had um, any meetings uh, in the last couple of days on Ukraine or any plan for later today to sort of discuss ongoing uh, military buildup of Russian troops on the ground there? And has there been any discussion about increasing military aid? Specifically, are there any military advisors on the ground, or is there any talk about putting advisors um, on the ground there? 
Thank you. A lot there, Alita. Um, I can tell you that the secretary did chair a meeting this morning um, with uh, key departmental leaders, including the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and General Walters out at UCOM, um, to discuss uh, the situation uh, in, uh, in Ukraine and, of course, uh, in Western Russia. Um, I won't uh, get into intelligence assessments, but he is staying uh, very keenly and closely informed uh, by uh, senior military and, and policy leaders here at the department uh, about what we continue to see, and what we continue to see is um, uh, uh, added capability uh, that, uh, that President Putin continues to add, added military capability uh, in, the, uh, in the western part of his country and around uh, Ukraine. Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of uh, decisions one way or another that the administration uh, may or may not make here. Uh, Lita, as you know, uh, President Biden uh, will be calling uh, and talking to President Putin tomorrow. Um, I think we need to let that conversation happen. Uh, what I would um, what I would point you to is the secretary's comments over the weekend when he was out at the Reagan National Defense Forum, uh, where you know he said and, and still believes uh, that the diplomacy and leadership can still make a difference here, um, and that uh, there needs to be space for that diplomacy and for that leadership. Uh, to come to play uh, to try to get uh, an outcome here that is destabilizing and that doesn't result uh, in any sort of uh, open or armed conflict. Yeah, Tom. Are there still U.S. military trainers in Ukraine? If so, how many? Uh, what kind of training are you providing? And also, what kind of uh, military equipment is still being provided to Ukraine? I, I don't have a specific number of, of uh, advisors that may or may not be on the ground. As you know, Tom, that's a sort of a rotational thing. Uh, and it's been, uh, um, it's been in keeping with uh, longstanding support uh, by uh, two different administrations about uh, making sure that Ukraine conti continue to defend itself. I don't have an update on, uh, um, on specifics with that with that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have an update, Tom. I don't, I, I, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, speculate one way or another on that. You have seen this administration, as well as previous administrations, uh, continue to provide security assistance uh, to Ukraine. Again, I'm not going to get ahead of decisions that haven't been made yet, um, uh, but, uh, but we have uh, provided uh, millions of dollars worth of lethal and non-lethal assistance uh, to Ukraine in just the last, you know, 10 months, 11 months. Uh, including anti-tank weapons. It has included uh, anti-tank weapons, absolutely, but also non-lethal assistance as well. Um, and as you heard the secretary say, um, you know, over the weekend, we're going to continue to look at that. Uh, and, uh, and nothing has changed about um, our commitment to making sure that Ukraine has what it needs to defend itself. And it's not just the United States, Tom, as you know. I mean, other NATO allies and partners have also helped contribute uh, to Ukraine's capabilities over the last several years. But again, I want to go back to what I said before. Uh, uh, we don't believe that conflict is, is inevitable here, and that there is time and space, and there's, there's room for diplomacy here to reach uh, the best possible outcome. Yeah, Abraham. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. Uh, two questions, uh, same topic. How is Secretary Austin reassuring NATO eastern flank allies uh, about this Russia troop buildup? Are there some specifics of additional rotations or capabilities? There's a lot of promise of assuring the, the defenses of those NATO allies, but what, what is he doing? Well, I, Abraham, I would — first of all, you're right. We are uh, uh, reassuring our allies and partners uh, in NATO across NATO, not just in the eastern flank, but certainly in the eastern flank, of, of our commitment uh, to them and to the alliance. There's no question about that. I don't have uh, new proposals or initiatives to announce today, but I would remind you, we've already done an awful lot through the European Reassurance Initiative that was started in the Obama administration and continued right up through today um, to make sure that we have uh, uh, a credible rotational uh, deployment scheme uh, uh, throughout many of those nations. Uh, that continues today. So again, I don't have any additions to add, but, but uh, nothing has changed about uh, the rotational support and assistance, the training, the exercises that we're conducting with many of these countries. Uh, all that continues. And if I may, uh, John, another question on the CR impact. Can you uh, talk about how that might impact research and development, especially in hypersonics, if there's a year-long uh, continuing resolution? 
Yeah, the secretary does believe that it will have an impact on our research and development uh, uh, programs. I think you know uh, we submitted with this budget uh, the largest uh, ever request for uh, R&D, uh, for science and technology R&D. Um, and not being able to start those initiatives uh, will definitely have an impact, not just on hypersonics. And I understand the interest in hypersonics, but it goes beyond that. Um, you've heard the secretary talk about integrated deterrence and making sure we have, and he talked about this on Saturday, and making sure we have the technology in place um, to better defend this nation against threats such as the, the kinds of uh, threats that could emanate from places like uh, Russia and China. Um, and when you can't start new programs, when you can't, begin to, you don't, you don't have that money to spend on that sort of investment, it absolutely will affect your ability, your capabilities going forward. You had another question, though, that I missed on this. Okay. Uh, let me go back to the phones here. Uh, Louis Martinez. Hi, Jen. Um, thanks for taking the question. Um, with regards to Ukraine, yeah, I know you said you have nothing to announce at this time, but does that mean that there's been some planning or some consideration about additional aid packages uh, to uh, Ukraine, and also over the weekend, there were some claims made by the Russian Ministry of Defense about some um, intercepts that may have gone maybe a little too dangerous. If you have any comment on that, thank you. Uh, on the on the first one, I, I, I'm just not going to get ahead of decisions uh, and options that uh, that the president uh, is going to consider. So I don't want you to read more or less into that, Louis. I'm not trying to signal that you know something's in the offing. Uh, back to my answer to Tom. I mean, we have provided tens of millions of dollars just in the last year, less than a year, uh, to assist uh, Ukraine in their self defense capability. Um, and as the secretary himself said, you know, we're going to constantly review that and look at that and. Um, uh, and uh, and make whatever appropriate recommendations are going forward. But I'm not going to get ahead of um, uh, of, the, of the president or, or the administration on this. And then on your second question about the intercepts, I did see uh, some comments made by uh, Russian authorities ab about an intercept. Um, and I think you probably saw European Command has already addressed this. Uh, this particular incident they were talking about uh, had to do with the uh, uh, risk to a civilian airliner from U.S. military aircraft. Um, there was no such risk. There was no such uh, 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 unsafe or unprofessional interaction, certainly not by the United States military. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was a matter that was simply resolved by common sense and uh, routine air traffic control procedures, getting two aircraft that were um, that were at the same altitude to not fly at the same altitude. And this happens, you know, thousands of times all, all over the world in all manner of different circumstances. So um, our Russian friends were uh, uh, speaking a bit hyperbolically about uh, an incident that actually didn't occur. Janie. Thank you, John. Uh, and last week, the United States in uh, ROK uh, Defense Secretary meeting in South Korea, you know that. Uh, Secretary yes, Austin. I was there. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. So, um, you make me <laughs> Secretary Austin noted that uh, in the Pacific region is a top priority for the U.S. Department of uh, Defense. Yeah. And uh, South Korea is aware that uh, United States in the Pacific strategy is primarily aimed uh, at the uh, containing China. That's the South Korea said that. So uh, therefore, South Korea Min Jae-in government is uh, still reluctant to join in the Pacific and the Quad concepts of China. What is your comment? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot there. I mean, uh, first of all, um, our approach to the Indo-Pacific is not about containing China or any other nation. Um, uh, it is uh, about, frankly, dealing with the continued uh, challenges to a free and open Indo-Pacific that we see mounted by China the coercion of their neighbors, economic uh, aggressiveness, as well as uh, maritime aggressiveness, particularly in the South China Sea. Um, so 
there's a lot of national security interests at play in the Indo-Pacific. China is not the only one. Certainly it is a, as the secretary said, a pacing challenge for this department and significant. And he had the opportunity to talk about the pacing challenge of China when he was in Seoul for his second visit. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I think, and I won't speak for Minister Sa, but uh, uh, the minister recognized and, and sees those challenges for themselves. They, they, they see that as well. Um, but primarily, the discussion in Seoul was about the threat posed by North Korea and threats to stability, stability and security on the Korean Peninsula and uh, a chance for the secretary to reiterate our ironclad commitment to our alliance with the ROK uh, and to our shared national security interests there on the peninsula, to making sure that uh, we continue to work towards the goal of a, a denuclearized uh, peninsula. That was, that was the focus. Now, I, um, I, I will, won't speak f for South Korean leaders and, uh, and, uh, and how they view the region and, uh, and what priorities uh, they're putting on their own uh, peace and security. That's for them to speak to. But I can tell you that the secretary left Seoul more confident than ever that this alliance was in a, a, a very good place uh, and that we were both uh, uniformly uh, committed to making it stronger going forward. Okay. Regarding the U.S. and South Korea agree the, uh, the strategic you know, plan, new, new strategic plan on this and uh, backlash from North Korea and China is expected. Uh, China is uh, more pressure to South Korea. It's significant right now, the reaction to uh, what we have previously. So what is your comment for this? If China is going to diplomatically pressure to North, I mean, South Korea, how did you uh, respond on this? Well, well, look, a couple of things. There. We're not making countries choose between the United States and China, and we understand that uh, South Korea has a bilateral relationship with China. We respect that. I mean, they're practically neighbors. Uh, in all respects, they, they actually are. Uh, and so we understand that. And they're not the only Indo-Pacific nation that has a bilateral relationship with China that, that is different than the one that we have. And, and we re respect that. Um, what we continue to see China do uh, with uh, nations throughout the region is to coerce and intimidate, uh, and to try to uh, move them to uh, positions of policy uh, and orientation that are more in keeping with China's view of what the region ought to look like and be like uh, than what most of the international community feels. <laughs> and certainly our concerns in the United States is that a lot of what China is trying to achieve in the region is actually inimical to what we believe is in our national security interest, and certainly in the national security interests of our allies and partners. I would remind you, five of our seven treaty alliances are in that region, and we take those commitments very seriously. Uh, again, I'll let the South Koreans speak for their bilateral relations. It's a sovereign country, and they should do that. Uh, but we are not unmindful of the kinds of coerciveness and, uh, uh, and intimidation that, that uh, China continues to perpetuate throughout the region. Thank yep. you. Carla. Oh, thank you. Um, two different topics, if I may. Um, first, I'm sure you've seen the Wall Street Journal report about China's attempt to seek a military base in Equatorial Guinea. Can you confirm that, um, that, they, that you've seen evidence that they are trying to establish a base there? What I would just tell you, as, um, as part of our normal diplomacy uh, to address maritime security issues, uh, there in that region, uh, we have made clear, the administration has made clear, I don't know, not the Department of Defense necessarily, to the leaders of Equatorial Guinea that certain potential steps involving the PRC uh, and the PRC's activities there uh, would raise national security concerns for us. And we've, we've been, uh, the administration has been clear about that. When you say national security concerns, can you help our audience understand what some of those may entail? Well, look, again, China's, just like we were talking about in, in the Pacific, uh, in Africa, they continue to try to uh, uh, coerce behavior uh, out of uh, many African nations uh, and try to intimidate, use economic leverage um, uh, to seek their own 
uh, national security uh, goals there, uh, which do not contribute uh, in the end run, we don't believe, um, uh, to the betterment of security and stability there and, to the, and, and for the interests of many of these African nations. Now, obviously, look, these leaders, of the, these are sovereign nations, uh, and we respect that they will have bilateral relations of their own. That, that's, that's the way the system works. Um, but what we have seen China try to do there and elsewhere around the world is uh, establish a foothold uh, uh, that they could use, um, that, they, that could advance their own uh, military goals. And I think that's, that's the real crux of the, the issue. I, I really don't think I want to get any deeper than that. Separately, um, the, the CR, the continuing resolution, included $4.3 billion for DOD to support Afghans on military bases. There's 34,000 that are still on these seven bases. Uh, can you help us understand what specifically that money can be used for? And, and if you have any sort of update on the timeline for finishing the process, could you share that? Yeah, um, I'll let Northcom speak to the specifics of how they're going to how that money is going to be broken down, but I think in, just in general, Carla, this is about, remember, the DOD mission here is to provide a safe and secure environment. It's basically housing them while they work through a process that we don't own that belongs to DHS and the State Department. Um, and so this money, and we're grateful for it, uh, will allow us to continue that mission while we still have uh, Afghans uh, on uh, uh, on military bases. I would tell you that over the weekend, and I, I can get you the exact numbers, um, I don't have them here handy, but we have now, um, uh, we now have, uh, we now have fewer uh, Afghans on military bases than, than ever before, um, and more now have processed out uh, than we have waiting to get uh, processed. Um, so that work continues. I don't have an update, only we have seven bases that are doing this now, um, and I don't have a specific update or timeline to announce on on when additional bases will no longer be used in that, for that mission. Uh, Fort Lee, as you know, has, has uh, halted their contributions to Operation Allies Welcome. There are still seven bases doing it, um, and, uh, and as we continue to see Afghans leave, that will certainly uh, make it easier for us to, to no longer have to use those seven bases and, and be able to close those missions down. I just don't have an update for you on the specifics of that. And, um, yeah. Just for my clarity, the 34,000 evacuee number, can we just determine if that's the final number after the reductions of this weekend or if that yeah, was the number see. as of Friday? Yeah, let me see. I mean, I might, if you give me a second here, I might just be able to, uh, okay, let's see here. Okay, Mike. I'm frozen. Oh, fantastic. I happen to be on the slide as well. You're a good man. Okay, so yeah, 34,000 in se seven uh, locations. Um, we have a capacity for 46,000, so obviously we're not meeting that. Um, did you want to break down by location or? to make sure the 34,000 34, seven locations I don't have an update on on how they're uh, on how they're doing in terms of like what the timeline is going to be um, but we're, we're we're glad to see that uh, you know, a majority of those who came to the United States have now been resettled Courtney so just on Carla's question you said that what we've seen is trying to trying to try to do is establish a foothold there and elsewhere so you're Confirming then that China is trying to build a military installation and in no, I'm not confirming that they're they're trying to build a military installation in Equatorial Guinea. I've said that we've expressed to leaders there uh, our, our concerns, our national security concerns, uh, and we absolutely have seen uh, China uh, try to establish footholds. I'm not saying just military footholds, just footholds in other places around the world, influence that uh, that they're trying to, to gain. And what, I mean, what leverage does the U.S. have over Equatorial Guinea? You know, by, you can express that they have, you have national security concerns about it, but I mean, what, what can the U.S. do really to convince them not to allow China to establish this foothold? Is there something that the U.S. is offering them? Or It's probably a better question put to my State Department colleagues. Uh, obviously, that's a, really a, a diplomatic issue. But I would, add, I would just 
offer that it, it's not so much about leverage. It's not so much about um, uh, uh, trying to get some sort of, you know, quid pro quo here. It, it's really about having an honest conversation with them uh, about the concerns that we have, and, and, and we've done that. Now, obviously, like I said, it's a sovereign nation, and we respect their uh, their right to have bilateral relations uh, uh, in, in manners that they see fit. But we wouldn't be doing right by our relationship, our bilateral relationship with them, if we weren't honest about what our concerns were. Mm -hmm. But it's not about enforcing some sort of leverage on them. And just to be clear, what level were those conversations? Was that like a DOD to? It wasn't. It, w it wasn't the, the, the Department of Defense. Uh, it, it, it was uh, done through diplomatic channels. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, John. My question is about U Ukraine. Uh, reports in U.S. media suggest that the U.S. intelligence uh, reached a conclusion that uh, Russia is planning to deploy 175,000 troops to the border and, again, planning to attack a military offensive in early 2022. So does the Department of Defense share that assessment? And should we expect an escalation in following weeks? Yeah, I think uh, I'd, I'd point you back to what the Secretary said over the weekend. I'm not going to get into intelligence assessments. I've seen the press reporting. Uh, all, as, as, as you have, I'm not, not going to speculate about that. What I would tell you is uh, we continue to see uh, a buildup of military, Russian military forces in, in the areas around uh, eastern, northeastern and eastern Ukraine, uh, but on obviously in western uh, Russia. Uh, th this buildup is concerning to us. It is still not uh, entirely clear what Mr. Putin's intentions are. Um, I, again, I won't speak for the White House. I think the, my, my colleague at the White House has already spoken to the President's upcoming conversation with President Putin. Um, and uh, uh, what we have done here at the department is continue to have conversations with our allies and partners ab about this situation, um, uh, sharing with them what we can uh, about what we're seeing, um, and making sure that that they know that our commitment to NATO and to alliance uh, priorities is um, is, is simply not going to change. But again, I I want to go back to what the secretary said. There's uh, there's room here for diplomacy. There's room here for leadership. There's uh, there's no reason. That, that, that this has to end up in some sort of uh, uh, conflict or in incursion. And again, I, I won't get ahead of the president's conversation. Yeah, Warren. John, can you give an, any update or any more information on the Syria drone strike from Friday? Uh, DOD had said there was a senior al-Qaeda leader and planner that was killed. Can you identify him? And can you give an update on, on the investigation into civilian casualties? So uh, what I can confirm is that uh, a senior leader with Haras al-Din, which is an al-Qaeda-affiliated group by the name of Musab uh, Kinan, was the person targeted and killed in a kinetic strike by U.S. forces near Idlib on the 3rd of December. Um, it was a strike conducted uh, uh, from an MQ-9 uh, unmanned uh, aircraft. The initial review of the strike uh, did indicate the potential for possible civilian casualties. I don't have any updates for you on that. I would point you to CENTCOM for that. As you know, uh, whenever there's a potential for that, they do their own investigation, and I certainly wouldn't get ahead of that. Um, on your second question, it, what, the, what review are you talking about? The, that one, the, the, the investigation. On this one. Start, yeah. yeah, all I know is that they've launched a, a civilian casualty assessment uh, report, which they're which they have to do when they think there's a potential. Um, and as far as I know, that's still ongoing. I don't know what the results might be. Tom. Uh, hey, John, welcome back. Uh, two questions. One on one, your opening statement um, in regard to uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Leaf. Was he, his appointment, is that one of the positions that have to be confirmed by the Senate? No, that's oh. a deputy assistant secretary of defense level, no. And my second question is, uh, the French have confirmed that they're planning to sell Mirage jets to the UAE. UAE is also looking for F-35s. How would you, how does the Pentagon assess the relationship, Secretary Austin just was there, how, how does the Pentagon assess the relationship with the UAE in regards to arms sales and the future deployment? 
Well, look, without getting into arms sales, that's really the purview of the State Department. Uh, we were just there. As you noted, uh, uh, the UAE is a tremendous partner uh, for the United States in the region. Um, we're uh, significant in helping us with the evacuation uh, of, uh, of Afghans uh, in August, um, and the Secretary wanted to thank them personally for that um, and uh, to talk to them about um, uh, continuing efforts for us to cooperate against um, uh, threats and challenges in the region, including uh, terrorist threats. Um, I, again, I won't speak about potential arms sales one way or the other. That's really the purview uh, of the State Department. Uh, but the only thing, again, that I'd add is um, uh, it was no mistake that we made a stop uh, in the UAE because of uh, what a significant partner they are. Thank you. Rio. Thank you. Uh, last week, the U.S. and China's defense officials had a, a working-level uh, virtual meeting on China's military power report. Yeah. Uh, what was the tone of the conversation, and did you get better understanding of China's motivation and strategy <coughs> to expand the nuclear capability? Yeah, I mean, this was a routine meeting at, at, a, uh, at a lower level in the department to uh, walk through the China military uh, power and assessment report that we submitted. Um, we gave a readout of that, Rio. I would point you back to that in terms of what was discussed. Uh, I wasn't in the room, so I can't give you a, a, a color of what the tone and tenor was. Um, but uh, my understanding it was a, it, that it was a professional uh, conversation uh, and, um, uh, and that there was no acrimony uh, necessarily represented on, on, on either side there. Um, separate and distinct from that, I mean, you've heard the, the Secretary talk about the China challenge in his speech at the Reagan Forum uh, on Saturday. I think he laid it out very well. Um, uh, we see this as a challenge, as a competition that does not need to uh, resort to conflict. And we see uh, the Chinese continue to develop advanced capabilities um, that, uh, that are clearly designed uh, uh, in many ways uh, to try to limit uh, uh, the access of the United States and other international uh, partners uh, in the Indo-Pacific, particularly the, the Western Indo-Pacific. Uh, do we have any update on the Secretary's future engagement with China's uh, counterpart? I do not. Um, Alex Horton, Washington Post. Hey, John. Thanks for that. Uh, welcome back. Um, curious if you can give us sort of a, a, a general overview of the rotational forces in Europe, you know, wh what units are aware um, and whether any future deployments have been moved up, accelerated, have any been extended on under deployments, what's sort of been the, the situation um, there, if any, in terms of movement either way. Uh, Alex, I'm going to take your question, uh, and because uh, I'm I'm not equipped with uh, that level of detail here in terms of who's where and what rotational deployments are ongoing, uh, I think that's gettable information, and we'll uh, we'll we'll do that. Um, I don't have any announcements to make today or any changes to the rotational posture to speak to. I think, as you saw when we rolled out the Global Posture Review a week or so ago. Um, uh, Dr. Carlin talked about uh, the importance of these rotational deployments and that they would continue. The Secretary reiterated that in recent conversations he's had uh, with uh, many of our partners. In fact, he talked to the Polish Minister of Defense on the way to Seoul uh, last week, and that was certainly one of his messages, was that, uh, that we value that relationship and those rotational deployments to Poland are going to continue. But let me get uh, let me take your question, if you'll permit me, and we'll see if we can get you a, a, a cleaner laydown. I just, I'm not equipped with that right now. Can you also take Tom's question about your, how many U.S. troops may still be training Ukrainians? I'm happy to take that. And what was I, the, he also asked about, um, oh, weapon sales, if it's like a continuing, uh, if the U.S. is still... What I can do, this? Court, is give you what we have already approved this year uh, 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 in, in terms of the security assistance. I'm not going to get ahead of decisions that haven't been made one way or the other. I will see if we can get him an answer on the advisors. Yeah, in the back there. Uh, are you seeing any reluctance from your Euro European alliance, uh, allies regarding common action that may be, may be taken against Russia uh, in Ukraine? I'm speaking here about Germany. I, I won't speak for other countries. The, the, uh, they would have to make decisions on their own. Um, uh, what I can tell you is that we continue 
to consult with our allies and partners, particularly our NATO allies, about what we're seeing um, and, um, and about what our concerns are. Uh, but each of those allies is a sovereign nation, and they have to make decisions for themselves about, um, about their assessments uh, of what we're seeing um, and whether and to what degree uh, they want to help hold uh, Russia accountable um, uh, should Russia uh, try to ma make an incursion into Ukraine, another incursion into Ukraine. I, I, I can't speak to that. All I can tell you is that uh, we're deeply concerned about it. Uh, we're watching it closely. We are consulting with allies and partners. And as the Secretary said over the weekend, we still believe that there's space for diplomacy and leadership here. One more question, please, about the Israeli Defense Minister visit. Israeli media. Uh, who, who's Defense Minister. Yeah. Uh, Israeli media reported that they uh, that the, the the minister will urge the U.S. to carry military strikes on Iran, and uh, prepare a plan B in case the negotiations fail. How do you comment on that? Well, uh, we, as you know, we are uh, in the midst of negotiations uh, to try to to get our way to to find a way back to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, that is really more from our National Security Council and our State Department colleagues to speak to rather than here at the Department of Defense. What the Secretary has made very clear is that no problem in the Middle East gets easier to solve with a nuclear-armed Iran, and that we continue to support here the efforts of our diplomats to find a way to return to the Iran deal. Um, now, the, our, our colleagues across uh, the river there have already spoken to um, how things are going in Vienna, I'd point you to them uh, as to how progress would uh, uh, is, is occurring. The other thing that the Secretary has said, that separate and distinct from our desire to see a diplomatic return to the JCPOA, he has an obligation, we have an obligation, to defend our interest in the Middle East, which means we have to continue to have a robust footprint there, and we do. We need to have a robust set of capabilities and operational concepts to use those resources, and we do. And the Global Posture Review that we laid out a, a week or so ago stresses that, reiterates that, that, uh, that would, obviously there are some changes that could occur over time, but in general, uh, we believe that uh, we are postured appropriately to defend our national security interests against a range of threats, uh, to include those threats from, uh, from, from Iran going forward. I'm not going to, I certainly won't speak for our Israeli counterparts uh, and what their intentions are one way or the other. Um, the, uh, and I think, well, the Secretary looks forward to meeting with uh, Minister Gantz later in the week. We'll have an official announcement out uh, uh, relatively soon about that, but he's looking forward to that discussion. It'll be the first of several, I'm not, the, the, the most recent of several that he has had with Minister Gantz since he became Secretary of Defense. option on that table in case the negotiation uh, I'm simply not going to get into hypotheticals here. Uh, we have a responsibility here to protect our national security interests in the region, and we're going to continue to look at, at that. What the, what the Secretary has said is he supports uh, very much a, a diplomatic resolution uh, to Iran's growing nuclear ambitions. And no problem in the Middle East gets easier to solve with a nuclear-armed Iran. Okay? Jim. John, the other day at the Reagan Forum, the, the Secretary said that he was concerned about the public's uh, uh, drop in the approval rating of the U.S. military. Uh, and then he said he would like to study it. As a first sort of iteration, do you have any uh, theories on why the public's perception of the U.S. military has fallen so much? Uh, well, what, what he said was he wanted to spend more time with the survey. I mean, he had he had, had a chance to, to look at it briefly uh, before going to the Reagan National Defense Forum. And I think you heard him say that Certainly, the numbers represented in that survey are not going in the direction he would like to see them in terms of trust and confidence. It's, uh, it's concerning. Uh, so I think he wants to take a little bit more time to, to look at it. Um, I won't speculate for him uh, about what's behind those numbers, uh, but I would point you to what he talked about there with his interview with, with Brett Baer, that, um, you know, that we're not, we are, we are an all-volunteer force. Um, and the men and women who serve in this department come from, from homes and families all over the country. Uh, and so the American public's perceptions of the United States military matters to us, not, not just from a recruiting 
perspective, although that's valid, but also from a representational perspective. Um, uh, and the, the trust and confidence in American people, we, we continue to believe is, um, is critically important uh, to the institution. And just like it matters to us, it also makes us, uh, we are not immune to the kinds of uh, polarization um, uh, that we see out in the American society. I mean, we, because we come from uh, America, what, what's out there in our society affects us. Uh, it absolutely does. Um, so I think he wants to spend a little bit more time and, and, and try to um, see if there's some, uh, some wisdom he can, he can glean from the survey. He obviously took it seriously when he had a chance to at least look at it uh, briefly. Um, the other thing he said is that uh, if he believes that if the American people could see what he sees when he's out there with our troops, like he was in Seoul, like he was just a week or so ago on, on a minesweeper in Bahrain, if, if, if they could see what he sees in terms of what the troops are actually focused on, not the perceptions of what they're focused on, but what they're actually focused on, uh, that, uh, that, the, that he's confident the American people would, uh, uh, would be just um, as proud as, as he is of them and, and just as confident in their capabilities. Uh, Jeff Shogel. Thank you very much. The 51st Striker Brigade Combat Team with the Florida National Guard is currently in Ukraine. Are they allowed to follow their charges into combat? Jeff, I'm going to have to take your question. Um, I have to confess to not uh, having at my fingertips the, the deployment schedules of the Florida National Guard. So. Uh, we'll, we'll see if we can take that question. We may end up referring you to the Florida National Guard or to the National Guard Bureau, Jeff, but uh, you're going to have to excuse my ignorance on this one. Thank you. Does, does the U.S. also planting any anti-personnel mines between Belarus and Kaliningrad to, to protect the Slovakia gap? I know of no such plans, Jeff. Okay, I'll take one more. Yes, ma'am. Oh, and then to you, Megan. Thank you for taking my question. Um, the, uh, one of the fastest growing areas of the U.S. economy is, uh, is in the uh, area of space. And, that's to, and the ability for that to continue to grow is based on a viable defensive space. And that, of course, brings us back to the continuing resolution and what that impact might have on uh, our well-educated service member, member population and the ability to continue being on the cutting edge of technology development. Um, can you speak to that? And then I have a, another question. I, I think uh, I would point you to the Secretary's statement on the potential for a long-term CR. Remember, look, the, the CR now funds us through mid-February. And as Carla noted, um, th there is some funds represented in there to help us with, you know, Operation Allies uh, Welcome. A CR is not the ideal way to fund the department. And I think everybody understands that. Um, and what we're concerned about here, and you hopefully saw it in the Secretary's statement, is the potential for a long term, maybe as long as a full year. Um, th that's where it really begins to be damaging, not just to our R&D uh, and to our ability to, to start new programs and, like I said, build new ships, uh, but also in terms of making sure our, 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 our troops get the, the pay raise that, uh, that they've so richly deserved. I mean, they'll still get that pay raise, but it'll come at a cost of other things that we'll have to, that we'll have to um, to, to defund or at least reduce funding for. So um, I would just point you back to what he, he said. I don't have any specific space impacts to speak to. Again, we're, th this is a partial CR now only until mid-February. Yeah. Okay, then my other question has to do with, um, since there is this perception of uh, U.S. focus being on uh, what's happening in Ukraine right now along the border there as Russia amasses troops, and then some of the uh, focus on the JCPOA, all of that stall out in the Middle East. Uh, is there any, has there been any diminution of uh, focus or force posture in the Indo-Pacific, especially around the um, sea, of J sea of Japan and all that area of the South? No, South not China's at all. Not at all. And I think, again, I'd point you back to the, uh, the global posture review that we, that we just recently rele released, which made clear that uh, the Indo-Pacific is our priority region. Um, the secretary was just there. 
uh, and gave a pretty comprehensive set of remarks uh, on Saturday about the, the China challenge specifically. Uh, we still are laser focused on that pacing challenge, uh, and uh, and I don't I don't see any diminution uh, of that effort, that focus, um, uh, and the application of resources to that challenge, uh, given other challenges around the world. Look, we're a global power. We have global responsibilities, um, and. Uh, it's not it's not either or it's not it's not focus on the china challenge at the expense of all others again i think if if, if you go through the global posture review you can see um, that uh, we're still investing in many places around the world we're still applying resources that's not just people and bases but actual capabilities all over the world and that that's going to continue we have global responsibilities that we have to meet we can walk and chew gum at the same time so another National Guard official is questioning the Pentagon's official narrative of what happened here on January 6th um, in terms of sending troops <coughs> over to the Capitol to stop the insurrection. The DOD IG has said that everything was good to go. I know you don't speak for the IG, but is there any motivation here to review or further investigate how all of that happened um, to sort of close the gap between what the DC Guard is saying? and what the Army slash the Pentagon has been saying about how that went. No, there'll be no such effort. All right, one more thing. Um, the Secretary last week gave the military departments today as a deadline to publish um, their policies for how they're going to enforce uh, vaccines for National Guard and for the Ready Reserve. Did those policies have to be um, sent up to OSD for any sort of approval or discussion, or did the Secretary read about them um, before the, the services? No, he's been well informed by the service secretaries, the military departments, about uh, about how they're executing on the, the mandatory vaccine. So, th so specifically for how they're going to enforce the National Guard and the Ready Reserve, has he, have, have they? Let me take that stuff? particular question. Okay. Because, again, the deadline for their publication is supposed to be today. Okay. Let me take that question. I, okay. I don't, I wasn't tracking the Reserve National Guard piece, so let me ask. Okay. All right. Yep. Question. Jeff Shogun's question about the advisors. He also asked if they are permitted to follow the, the, the people they're training to the front, uh, and you didn't address that part of it. I'm, I'm not going to. Um, I mean, are they permitted to do that? Is the question. Not will they do that, but are they permitted to do that? Yeah, yeah I, I, I took the question. I'm going to leave it at that, Tom. Oh, okay. uh, but to the larger point here, um, uh, there's no reason for this to uh, 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 to come into uh, to come to blows there's no reason for this uh, to become a conflict as the secretary said there's still space for diplomacy and leadership I understand and appreciate the way of asking that question to, to try to, 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 to have a to, to get me to speculate on whether or not you know we're going to get involved or not I, I mean but um, no no Tom I'm not talking about from you I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um, the way it was first posed, um, but uh, but uh, so I'll take the question. I'll find out, uh, or we'll send them to the National Guard Bureau to, to to get an answer to that. I was not I'm not informed about the Florida National Guard's deployment schedule, but um, as the secretary has said and said many times over the weekend, there's still space and time for diplomacy and leadership. There's no reason for this to devolve into uh, armed conflict. Um, uh, and what we will continue to do and what we have done in Ukraine is help, help uh, Ukraine defend itself, to help them with self-defense capabilities. Uh, and that effort continues. And again, I won't speculate about future decisions, but we've been very clear about that. Okay. Thanks, everybody.